Hi, friend. Hi, friend. And to the brave hearts listening out there, welcome to Permission to be Human. I'm Andrea. And I'm Janelle. Get ready for some real-time relationship woo and wisdom from the front lines with occasional tantrums and tears about how breaking rules, blurring boundaries, and tossing tradition can be catalysts for finding your truth. Let's debunk the fairy tales we were told as children and create a new map for life. Yes, Disney can go fuck itself. (laughs) If you're seeking permission to choose your own path, freedom is the new F word, people. And want to feel less alone along the way, we we got got you. Please note, this is our side of the story. Our partners and metamors have their own individual experiences, and we do not speak for them. Here we are, Andrea. Here we are, Janelle. Back at it. Yep. Their spirit crowns on. Yes. And if we have realized that some of the words we use now in this podcast, um, we didn't even use a few years ago. And if they were confusing to us a few years ago, they might be confusing to you too. Yep. So we think some clarification might be good. Yes. Thank you to my good friend, Pete, for reminding me of that. We need to give a little bit more context about what we're saying. Pete, you are such a gem. Okay, the first word we're going to describe is spirit crowns because we are both wearing one today. And we almost always wear one on the podcast. Yes. And whether you can see us or not, we can see each other. And so we want to describe to you when we say we're wearing a spirit crown, what that means. One, they are a headpiece. They are designed by our friend Sophie Howell. You can find them. If you actually want to just go see what they look like, you can go to spiritcrowns.com. And they are high end individually curated headpieces crafted with love and intention. They are beautiful. They are creative. They are sustainable. And every time I put one on, I feel like a goddess. That's amazing. And yeah, spirit crowns are meant to mark milestones or magic moments. And they can be worn every day, as Janelle proved by wearing hers to Trader Joe's today. Yeah, yeah, it was Sunday. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wear a spirit crown today. And even though I say that they activate like the goddess in me, she also, they, they can activate the goddess in men too. She, they are, there are different ones that can be worn by any gender. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. So I'm going to describe what Janelle's spirit crown looks like right now. <laughs> so we've got four tall plumes of brown feathers on both sides. I would say they're more than a foot long. Each more than a foot long. Yes, Mm -hmm. that's right. Then we have, they're beautiful. They look like rhinestone pins that you might have in. Like a brooch. Like a brooch. That's the word I couldn't think of. In the 20s. So there's one of those on either side. They have white and blue stones in them. You've got tassels spread along the front, dipping down toward your nose in gold. And then you also have this material. Through brocaded fabric. Yeah, a brocaded fabric also that comes up in a crowd. We've got blue, brown, gold, white. It's regal looking, I would say. And if you do want to see it, you can see it. We'll post pictures of us on Instagram today so you can see us. Awesome. So what's mine look like? I even forget what I put on (laughs) this morning when I put it on. (laughs) So Andrea's also is, think of Princess Leia in the sense that it's a headpiece that goes around her forehead that has two big flowers and what almost looks like a sea urchin design or a thistle flower on this side. <laughs> Dark purples, maroons, and then some bright red uh, ornamental poppies throughout. Mm. Then above each ear, you have four brown feathers going out, plus and a lighter colored feather, very long, going all the way back about a foot. Um, the band across your head is light purple with this gorgeous uh, multi-layered star, beadwork, brocade, rhinestones, and then dangly coins on each side. Thank you for that beautiful description. And these spirit crowns tie in the back. They don't sit on your head like a typical crown. They've got this really soft fabric. Um, black fabric that wraps around your head. So they're pretty comfortable to wear. Okay. Great. That's the spirit crown. Now you know. Now you know. And so a word on vocabulary. Why are we doing this episode? Well, did you know that a dedicated vocabulary is one of the red flags of a cult? We are not a cult, though. 
We are not. We swear. We are not a cult and we, are, we don't belong to a cult. <laughs> that is correct. That's the other reason why we're saying we're <laughs> doing this episode to declare that. Uh, so Jamie Wheel, in his book, uh, his book, Recapture the Rapture, points out that one of the signs of a cult is when there's a vocabulary that others don't understand. And as a result, it isolates you from when you're talking to friends and family. Mm, wow. And I had coffee with a close friend who I hadn't seen or spoken to since before the pandemic a couple months ago. And he called me out. He was like, I don't know the context of the words you're saying. Container, intimacy, ENM. He's like, like, who are you? Like, what, like, what <laughs> happened? Right, right. And I actually really appreciated that because my whole world right now feels like I'm, I'm immersed in a community of people who we all talk the same way. And I'm able to explain to my dad and my brother what all these words mean. But it was, uh, it was like, a, like a recognition that I was like, wow, I have really changed a lot in the last five years in terms of my interest. Like I, before I, he was like, you're not talking about mountain biking anymore. You're right. talking about spirituality. You weren't spiritual before. What happened? Yeah, where's the happy hour? <laughs> and yeah, and so it was a big, I, I, it helps me just recognize how much I had changed. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so on this episode, we're not a cult. We are not experts at anything. We're not well, leading you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the answers. We are not peddling any new trendy products. Well, spirit crowns, but not for our own profit. Yeah. And we are both coaches and we do have expertise in other things, but not in the topics we're about to talk about. Right. We just have, we just have a shared experience. Right. Definitely don't take our word as the final word. We just know that when we hear of someone doing something we hadn't thought of, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on what we thought we knew. Yeah. And this embodies our entire mission for the podcast, right? We are sharing the story of our lives and we're sharing our truth. And we hope that that gives you permission to find your truth. Ta-da. With that, we will go on to how to understand Janelle and Andrea, the yeah. podcast. Yeah. First category, personal growth. So I've only used this word once, but I really want to start using it more. Um, because I, I just made it up recently. So this is, this is an Andrea original. Most of the words you'll hear today are Janelle's. She somehow comes up with these amazing words that I have adopted. But this one is Baja, right? So at age 16, um, to Baja was to get in a very large pickup truck or Jeep and drive off into the road, into the forest or the swamp, like running everything over basically and just like going really fast on really mountainous hills, basically just back roads, and maybe getting off the ground a little bit when you get up to the top. <laughs> so did you do that? Yes, yes, for okay. sure. Okay. Like, yeah, like we call it back roading, basically, okay. or bahaing. Like, can we go bahaing tonight? Okay. With my boyfriend. So that's what Baja meant at 16 in a small town. <laughs> um, Baja definition at age 46, um, I'm 47 now, is short for the brave aha moments. Hmm. So I'm loving that because brave aha moments are definitely, they provide me a lot of sweetness. Yes. And yeah. a lot of courage. Okay. So now I can say, hey, I see you bahaing. Is <laughs> yes. that, is that, is that how Let's you do that. that. Let's That's do it. Use it in a sentence. That's what you use it in a sentence. I see you bahaing. Okay. Hey, I bahaed today. <laughs> Let's see if we can work it in. <laughs> okay. Become, do you want to talk about becoming? Sure. So. The phrase becoming, um, that I, it's, it's finding the most extraordinary expression of myself through continued growth and expansion. And this actually came through from my husband and it was part of our vows that he wrote, which was, we want to support each other's becoming. And even though we're divorced, we actually still stand by those vows with one another. Beautiful. Yeah, and I have really picked up on that word, and it's, it feels good. It feels good to say it, um, not only the definition, but, but how it feels in my heart. Because I know that you say this to your husband as well. Yeah, I like, basically I say, look, whatever happens with us, I want to support your becoming, and he wants to support mine too, and that, that feels amazing. Next one. Yes. Imagined reality. Right. I started saying this a couple of years ago, 
This is basically looking through the lens of what something or someone could be or should be. Uh huh. Sometimes realistic, sometimes wildly unrealistic. Uh huh. And not looking at it through the lens of what is actual reality. And what the, really where it sunk in was that I realized that I often was grieving the loss of my imagined reality. And what was the imagined reality? Like, you know, but that my relationship didn't look exactly like I wanted it to look. And so I was grieving the loss of that when act, like the actual way that my relationship looked was totally different. And that wasn't what was making me sad. So I sometimes mourn the imagined reality of my marriage. And that imagined reality was the fairy tale, which I know now does not exist. I think you also talk about this. Yeah. And, and that was, I mean, I use it in the same way you do, that the imagined reality was something that I just thought would happen over time because I was told, okay, here's what's going to happen when you're an adult. Here's what's going to happen when you have kids. Here's what's going to happen when you get married. And I soon realized that was not going to happen. I also experienced it the other day with a client. She said to me, Andrea, I was hoping to leave this job with everything a little further along, you know, more buttoned up, more finished, more polished, right? Everything done. And I said to her, would that time ever really exist? Is there such a scenario when everything's finished and completely put together in a corporate setting and there's no new projects started and there's no fires you have to put out? And she said, no. And I said, then remember that this is your imagined reality. Um, it doesn't actually exist. So this, this is an important one for us across the last five years. Agreed. The next one is my phrase Yay. of, uh, I feel deeply and hold lightly. I want to live with my heart fully open to cherish in all of the joy and the pain i.e. to experience all of the agony and the ecstasy, one of my favorite <laughs> books, while simultaneously recognizing that everything is impermanent and to hold the present moment lightly because it too will change. I love this one. Like I reflect on it a lot because I, of course, I want to love deeply. I always mess it up. What is it? Say it again. Feel deeply. Feel deeply. I want to feel deeply, but hold lightly. And just recently, I noticed that I was feeling deeply and I was holding tighter and I was holding tighter and I was holding tighter. And I'm like, fuck, like, how do you do it? Like, it is definitely a practice, like a muscle that I feel like I have to strengthen and I'm getting better at it. But the initial is to grip. And this, of course, like reminds me of an 80s song because, <laughs> because 38 specials song called Hold On Loosely from like 84 when they're like, hold on loosely. Don't let go. But if you cling too tightly, you're going to lose control. They were teaching me about Buddhism and relationships when I was 10. Right? I'm telling you, this is good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, don't hold on too tightly. You'll be fine. Edge. Right. Um, our edge is the point where I'm aware I'm out of my comfort zone. A lot of growth happens here. It's uncomfortable, but in my opinion, worth it. It's, you know, using it in a sense it's like doing a 10 day silent Vipassana meditation retreat really took me to my edge. And I remember you telling me about doing a meditation retreat, maybe when you were in India. Mm -hmm, that's the one. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> so, and you were like freaking out, talking to your husband on the phone, being like, I can't do this. Yeah, I can't. Crying, <laughs> sobbing sobbing tears because I had to give my phone over and we weren't supposed to talk for 10 days. And I was like, oh, I'm going to die. I can't die. <laughs> and that was in the early days of phones. Like it was probably a flat phone or something. Like, yeah, it, wasn't it, was, even, it wasn't even a smartphone. Right. Don't know. It was 2015. 2015. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember when you yeah. did that. So something I wanted to share with the Bravehearts as an idea uh, is... My husband, when we were still dating, he had the suggestion that we take a word a month for an entire year of words that 
are really big words that we just assume we know the definition of. And some of those words were truth, love, family, respect, communication. And we would take a month to each of us on our own, research, and then come up with our definition. I'll also just point out that he actually did this with his son when his son was maybe like 13 as a family, that the two of them would do this. And so that they were, so that the goal of this was that we would become on the same page for these big words that otherwise, if we tossed around, could easily lead to really big misunderstandings. And when we get to an episode on truth, I mean, it was like, we, it was like, wow, we were just coming from two totally different places of how we defined, experienced, sorry, not truth, trust. Trust was another word that we looked at. And so in this way, I, I learned from him that having a shared vocabulary, but not just the word, but the definition of the word is actually really critical to like solid relating and understanding of one another. So that's partly what I see us trying to do here is that we're sharing our definitions and experiences of these words so that you A, have a chance to reflect on them for yourself, but then as listeners and even you as, and you and I get to know each other and know how to relate to each other better. I can't believe I've never heard this before. Like I would be, I'm going to start doing this immediately with my daughter. Okay. Like, right. This is such a great idea. Yeah. It was incredible. It was really deep. I mean, yeah, he's, he's incredible. Yeah. That's beautiful. It was also really interesting to note that for me, the definition always had to be used in a sentence for me to understand it fully. Absolutely. Like, whereas it wasn't for him as much. Like he was able to like be more in the abstract. And I was like, can you see it in a sentence? And so it was also how we understood concepts came through in this practice as well. Wow, I'm just taking that in. Because I have questioned the word love, I think, in the last five years quite a bit. Not because I don't love and continue to love in lots of different forms of my life, but it has looked so different in different situations. And I have talked to some people who say it gets tossed around too much. Now, we're always saying we love, the, we love this person. We love, I love you. I mean, we, you and I say we love each other. And then other people who think you can't do it too much, right? There's, you, you can always spread the love and share the love. And that, that, that in itself is two different, very different perspectives on the word love. And therefore, it would be fascinating to see what those people define as the word love. Right. The person that you, that you care about enough to want to know how they're defining it and or how, right? Like if someone's like, if you say, I love you to someone and they're like, she doesn't mean that. Right. Right. When you're like, no, I, I do really mean that. Like, so then it helps you. Yeah. I would say that the other, an example for me was when it came to the word family. He and I came from very different backgrounds of family. And so getting to understand each other's view of it through that lens, as, as we were coming together to say we were becoming family. Well, what did, how, what did that mean? How are we joining our two separate experiences of family into one? Beautiful. Okay. Tell me about radiance. <laughs> Radiance is when we're speaking from our highest self with certainty and without defensiveness. When used in a sentence. <laughs> I wanted to tell my dad about being polyamorous, but I waited until I could be sure I was telling him in my radiance. I.e., for a long time I knew poly resonated with me, but it was also really hard, as Andrea can attest to. Yep. I was processing myself for years. We were. There was a lot of pain in the growth, and the growth was worth it. But I knew my dad would be worried and whether it was good for me. And I was and I waited many years until I had like really, as I say, settled into my radiance to express it to him so he could receive me fully and know that I was okay. Beautiful. I love this one. 
It, it comes up a lot for me. And unfortunately, though, I feel like I, I can start to say things and I'm halfway through it and I'm like, nope, totally not in my radiance right now. <laughs> like I'm, I'm somehow defending or I'm like lecturing. I'm expecting someone not to like it or not to understand it. And that's when I know I'm not in my radiance. And this can be about anything, mm -hmm, you know, right. about a new job or parenthood or marriage or per our perspective. Yeah. Be, uh, yeah, anything. So I love this. And really the, the phrase is in my radiance, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, love it. I mean, I think you should take this one too. No, really? you're going to go. No, reflection. you totally taught me this. It's all you. Okay. So, the, so reflection is where within a conversation, instead of offering advice, you offer a reflection of what the person said. So you serve as a mirror. So this usually starts with, I hear that, or you seem to be, you know, in this way, we let the speaker come to their own conclusion and find the answers and insight from within. It's probably a therapist term, although my, my husband's never mentioned it. I really don't know. And I, and I got it from human design that I'm a reflector. Oh, right. Is that when you, that's how you started saying it. So here's what happens. I'll like go, blah, this is going on with me, you know, for a long time. And then Janelle will quietly listen and not jump in at all. I don't really know how she does it. I'm getting better at this, but also she'll have just this continuous smile on her face. No, she's like not freaking out. She's never like, oh my God even though I told her some crazy things. And at the end of it, she says, and after I speak and speak and speak, and then I stop talking and she waits like a full minute to see if I have anything else, which is what I do now. Also, I do it much better. And then she says, would you like a reflection? <laughs> and I always say, yes. <laughs> and that's and how I it say, works. I heard you say. Uh -huh. Or yeah, I hear that you seem to be I heard you say two months ago, and I'm hearing you say now, she's connecting the dots for me. It's beautiful. You can learn more about this on episode eight, uh, Friends with Benefits, a new definition. Okay, next word is plant medicine. Ooh, yeah, it's a big one. It's tightly uh, connected to psychedelics, which we'll also define. Um, but plant medicine are medicines made from natural compounds, from plants, leaves, bark, roots, seeds, or flowers that people can use for medicinal purposes. Note, in Colorado, we just passed legislation that decriminalizes the use of some of these plants. Mushrooms would be a common one that yeah. many people have probably heard of. And mm -hmm. Colorado is definitely in the forefront of, of this type of law. And psychedelics are a subclass of hallucinogenic drugs whose primary effect is to trigger non-ordinary mental states. These could be called psychedelic experiences and or an apparent expansion of consciousness. Right. So as you can see, we read these definitions to you. We got these online and we throw around the words plant medicine and psychedelics when we've had experiences with them. So we just want you to have some context about what we're talking about. And I would say that in the context of when we are using them, that it is, the experiences are through for the purpose of expansion of consciousness. Um, they are very intentional. They're often, like we take them in a ceremonial way, meaning that either someone is facilitating it and or there is, we haven't gotten to the word container yet, but a tightly held <laughs> container. Well, we, we'd stick with us and you'll get to that word. And the point is, is that when we're talking about these, we're not talking about like, like I actually never did any of these drugs until I was 45. <laughs> no raves for you. No raves for me when I was 19 or 20 or 16 or 30 even. So I, I started the deep fear of these, but then also became like, so came, approached them with a lot of intention. And after reading the book, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan who's the New Yorker author. The book is unbelievable. I highly recommend it. Nice. So let's jump into compersion. Compersion is our wholehearted participation in the happiness of others. So it's a, like a sympathetic joy we feel for somebody else, even though their positive experience doesn't benefit us directly. So like it can be, 
is often defined online as the um, opposite of jealousy and possessiveness, particularly in the polyamorous world. For example, I have compersion for the joy my husband finds in his girlfriend. And I don't get any joy out of, out of that directly. You know, he's getting the joy, but I am joyful watching him be joyful. Mm-hmm. And that's, the, that's compersion. I, you have compersion yeah, for, your, yes. for your husband in that moment. Or very simply, I have so much compersion for my daughter. I love seeing her laugh while she jumps on the trampoline. That is also compersion. Now, strangely, when you type compersion into Google Drive or in a Google Doc, they do not recognize the word. It's just not part of the lexicon. So to learn more about compersion, listen to episode nine, Conscious Relationships and Compersion. It's for cats too. And yeah, you might want to try it out. Okay, next one, emotional release tools. So these are practices that can help you release emotional energy from your body. Not going to go super into them. To learn more, listen to our episode called Dancing, Pushing, and Pillow Screaming, Why Emotional Release Tools Are Helpful AF. (laughs) Uh, And they really are. And we learned, both of us learned about emotional release tools at ISTA, which is the International School of Temple Arts which is a Tantra retreat workshop that um, both of us ha- got, have had a lot of benefit from going to, and we refer to a lot in the podcast. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Okay, that was our personal growth category yeah. down. Nice. I'm, feeling, I'm feeling like nice. a, a good encyclopedia right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brave hearts, are you getting all this? Okay, NVC. Let's talk about NVC. Nonviolent communication. I, th- I would actually think that like the, the example we gave in the reflection is also part of like NVC communication where it's like, it's like listening, active listening is another term here. Yeah, uh, that's right. So nonviolent communication, also known as NVC, uses consciousness, language, and communication skills to create a framework for which you can express your feelings and needs with clarity and self-responsibility. You're listening to others' feelings and needs with compassion and empathy. And the, ben- the result is that it facilitates a mutually beneficial outcome for everyone involved. Yeah I, yeah, I love the principles of this. And my husband and I were just discussing it the other day and thinking, how many people can actually get to NVC at the height of a trigger in an argument? I don't know. We can do it with intention if we're setting aside a time to talk about said difficult topic. Um, I'm getting better at coming back down from my trigger, from my, (laughs) there's trigger. We'll talk about that later. (laughs) Coming back down from my annoyance or my (laughs) emotional reaction to use NVC. However, it's a challenge, no doubt about it, as as effective as it is. What about you? There are, there's books on this. There's workshops on this. There are websites all about NVC. I remember when I first learned it, I like took notes. I have the book. I would like write like, like here's like the five yeah. points of it. Yeah. I wrote them down. Then my husband and I would be in a conversation. I would have my notes book in front of me. Point one. Am I doing it correctly? Point two. And he'd be like, No, you already missed point two. We haven't even gotten <laughs> point three. I mean, it was it was like a painful like yeah like learning process for me to get to being able to do this well. So do you have any thoughts on that? Why is it so counterintuitive if it's so effective? I think, for, I think it's a skill. And these are the skills that we do not get taught in our families, around the dinner table, or in schools. And you don't, at least in my experience, like there could be some corporate environments that teach this or more likely like therapy, like facilitator type environments that teach this. But we just are not great culturally at explaining to people how to be in a relationship and how to relate to others and communicate to others. You have to really seek it out. And as someone who, like, I used to think I was a really good communicator because I talked a lot. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, and let's, let's let's be honest. I I am a good, I mean, I'm a, I'm a prolific communicator. I don't not communicate. Like, right. when we, typically when I'm referring to, because I've had, um, I've worked with vendors or team members in the past, 
not good communicators. And when I say that, I'm like, they're not telling me things. Why aren't they telling me things? So this is a different level of good communicator. This is a type of communicating. It's definitely a type of communicating. And I will also say it's like different from a family. I think you too, right? Where my, in my whole family, like everyone like talks, my friend groups, like we all talked over one another. Yes. And again, I was a skill I had to learn, which was to not talk over one another. When hearing you give me all these props about how good I am at listening, I got, that's a, these are all skills that I have learned in the last five years to become very conscious and in tuned to. Yeah. And this reminds me of a, well, it reminds me of an Elizabeth Gilbert quote first, is that most of our life, this isn't the quote, but this is the, the setup, is that most of our life we're talking and we start to talk at the end of the other person's sentence, right? We don't let them finish and take a breath because we're afraid we're not going to get to talk, right? We're fighting for talk time. And something that she said in Eat, Pray, Love was interrupting someone basically says, what I have to say is more important than what you have to say, right? It's a pretty basic tenet. But I remind myself of that a lot because I still do it sometimes, right? If I'm feeling like I'm going to get crowded out, I'm not going to get to talk, this person's talking so much, then I start clipping people off, right? And there was a a practice on a conference call I was involved in with a meditation community where the facilitator would inject and we pause after each person's comment so that they didn't cut each other off. Particularly on a conference call, this would be incredibly effective because Mm -hmm. conference calls can be such a nightmare. But that takes a lot of time. And most people are not willing to have a facilitator do that. So it, it, and and then my question to you is, where can my daughter learn NBC? Go online, check it out. I think, yeah, I would love to have her take a class in that. And she's only 13, but I want to teach her this now before she develops the bad habits. I also think mirroring, I think that you, the fact that you've gotten better at it, that, you know, that your husband's good at it, like, you know, you're, I'm sure you're also practicing it with her every day, even if it's not, you're like calling it out in a yeah. workshop format. Yeah, exactly. That's true. So Hopefully good job. we're being models. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so there's two words, becoming conscious or awakening that we're not going to define. And we use these words all the time. <laughs> and I'm aware of that. And there are entire bodies of work that study consciousness and awakening. And so I'm not going to pretend that I can define it. I love that. I wondered why you left that blank. (laughs) Great. So don't forget active listening. So active listening is listening to understand instead of listening to respond. Very related to what we were just talking about. And I first had the experience of active listening during what's called a dyad in a meditation center. So I'm set up with another person. We're one-on-one. We're in our our meditation poses and we're looking at each other. And I ask her a question. And my goal in that moment is not to think of how I'm connected to her or to think about what she's telling me and get more curious about the questions I'm going to ask her It's just to listen. And when I first did this, it was incredibly challenging for me. Like I don't, it's so hard for me just, just to take it in, right? I'm just receiving. I'm just receiving. I'm just receiving. And, uh, but I've spent years working on this. And so I have gotten much better at it, but it is, it's not really how society operates. And it's, um, it's a good practice. Okay. Conscious relationships. We did a whole episode on this. Yep. Conscious relationship is a romantic relationship in which both partners feel committed to a sense of purpose, and that purpose is growth, individual growth and shared growth as a couple. Collective growth that makes the world a better place. To learn more, you can listen on our episode of Conscious Relationships and Compersion. It's for cats, too. That's right. (laughs) Okay, conscious uncoupling, take it away. Conscious uncoupling is a term used in the 21st century to refer to a relatively amicable marital divorce. The term was created by this author that I have loved and referred to before, Catherine Woodward Thomas. It was popularized by Gwyneth Paltrow in 2014, 
when she used the phrase to describe her then recent divorce. Um, it's how I describe the divorce from my husband. And again, there is a book um, you can read called Conscious Uncoupling, which I highly recommend. And you can also look at the website mindbodygreen.com to learn more. Yay! Another one of our favorite words, sisterhood. That's right. A bond between two or more women, not always related by blood. They always tell the truth, honor each other, and love each other like sisters. Oh, that's so sweet. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> um, it really is true and it's cheesy, and, but neither Janelle nor I have a sister. Right. And I, I also imagine that there's some people don't view that their relationship with their sister in, that, in those terms. But I think the important thing that I want to convey is that the essence of sisterhood is like fundamental to my well-being in life. And that my relationships with the women who I think of as sisters, Andrew being one, I have many others, who I trust will tell me the truth about me, what they see, they have my best interest yes. at heart, whether, you know, whatever it is that I'm going through is like how I have survived my entire life. And I know there's a lot of women who've never experienced that kind of bond with another woman. And... I also think this is, this is a, a type of a relationship. There's some, some skills that can be cultivated in order to get to that. But I just want to say that it's been like this type of relationship is actually probably the most important type of relationship in my life. I couldn't agree more. I, t I, I agree. Was it always easy to be called out in such an honest way from a sister? I definitely think there are times that I, I've been very, very defensive about being called out. But I was someone where, like, I've just had good like, girlfriends my whole life. So I don't know that, like, the truth bombs were, like, what the base on it in, like, high school. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think through that question. But I can def, but I could, I guess my point being, I can definitely think of times when I got very defensive when someone called me out, but I can also say that I never questioned their love for me. Mm. And so even if I didn't believe what they were saying or like want to believe it, I didn't think like, oh, they were a bad person. Well, I think you were more evolved than me. Faux <laughs> <laughs> show. Sure. Um, because I think early on, I was just so tuned in to the people pleasing and telling people what they wanted to hear that I didn't know how to receive some honest feedback. And I, I think, you know, that, that definitely changed at some point, but swallowing my pride and like putting down my ego was definitely a process for me mm -hmm. um, over time. I don't know if I questioned their love. I don't know if I thought about their love. I just knew that I had to defend my place. Right. And so that comes up first, right? Fighting back, fighting back, fighting back. Um, that was definitely the MO for a long time, like, because image was so important to hold up the image of me in my mind and in this person's mind and in the public. I also, I hear that. And there's, there's this flavor of mean girl that I just want to acknowledge that, again, a lot of women, I think, who don't experience sisterhood is because they experience the mean girl syndrome, either from the receiving end or giving end. Yeah. and. So that, like, I think all of it's taught to us, right? And so if there's another way you want to be, then you can learn it in a relationship. Beautiful. External processing. <laughs> That's us. Right, right. The external processor is a person who tends to develop their ideas while talking <laughs> about them. It's definitely me. My husband just like sits and waits and gathers all of his thoughts and puts them together and then says something. I, I don't even know. I don't even know how to do that. Right? <laughs> I mean, I've tried before, but I, I find it challenging. Um, so the external processor is actively thinking. They turn their thought process into sentences at the same time. First half, I thought this was an interesting fact. The first half of most meetings are usually dominated by the external processors in the room. Wow. Kind of makes sense. 
And this is what Janelle and I have talked about, what our favorite Voxer or any walkie talkie app allows you to do is externally process as you talk because you can leave 14 minute messages in real time. And cheers to my friend Leslie for loving this word um, when she listened to our podcast. She is also an external processor. And I remember externally processing with her all throughout college. So fun. And here's a hack uh, for people who don't have someone who wants to externally process with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it? Is that you can leave a message to yourself on a voice memo. And so as if you were talking to someone else, but you're just talking out loud about whatever it is that you're processing. And then you listen to your voice memo to yourself. So then you can hear what you said. Yeah. And the amount of times that you and Andrew and I have done that and listening to our messages that we've left, although we've left them for one another, I will listen to my own message again. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not, I didn't actually mean that. This is more clarify, clarifying. And it's such a useful tool. It is. Okay. Next word is container. Yes. And I always, when you say this word, I swear to God, my entire life, I'll never get rid of it. When you first say container, I think about a Tupperware. Like that's what I think about first. <laughs> Which makes sense. That's, it's, it, that's an, and that's a valid, that is an accurate <laughs> description and definition. Um, but the context, and this is when my friend was like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Um, what I hadn't seen in, in a few years is when, I, when we say that someone who holds a tightly held container, right? That context is referring to a group experience and how that group was held by the facilitator. That someone who holds a high, tightly held container is clear about the rules, is skilled at reading the energy in the room, provides a safe space to be vulnerable, and behaves with accountability if something doesn't go as planned. All in all, that container, the idea of a tightly held container is for the participants to feel, I'm going to say safe in their body, expressing themselves in whatever form. I mean, there's, there's no definition to what the container can look like or what's happening inside of it, but it's, when you say there's a loosely held container, it's like, I'm not really sure what's going to happen here. And you might be a little bit more, I've in situations like that, I've been a little bit more on guard. I'm like tracking what's going on in the room. Is that person really like in integrity? So this, the word comes up a lot for those of us who are in group spaces. Yes. And I would also like to say that this can apply or it has applied for me when I'm choosing a therapist as well. And that's not a group space, but Maybe you don't refer to it as a container. Maybe it's just holding space, which we get to later. But I, I do feel like there is, you know, some offices or some spaces or some people, whether they're adding music or you're sitting on a couch or what the light is, you know, that also to me is a container where I either feel safe or I don't feel safe. Um, when, when I say safe, I mean safe to express, safe to be vulnerable. So it feels like a container could also be just a couple of people. It definitely can be a couple of people. Um, and I think what you described is accurate. If, if you're not, I think, it's, I think it's different than holding space. Yeah. Holding right. space is showing up for someone, being fully present without judgment as you sit with that person through their difficult time. The key here is that it's not about you. Yeah. Like we think this is a critical relationship skill. Um, it's one thing to learn this. Like when you're just listening to a friend, right? Like Andrew can be talking to me about a, you know, a problem, a challenge that she's having with her husband or one of her relationships. And I have nothing to do with it. So it's easy for me to hold space yeah. and just listen so that she can express what she needs to express. It becomes a whole other level of expertise <laughs> you get when it. you are holding space for someone and they are upset with you. You're being triggered and at the same time, you're trying to hold space for yes. them. Really, really um, challenging. Yes. And I will also say it's, it, it, to, to use it in a sentence is also that, you know, just last night, a friend of mine sent me a, a picture of him smiling. I'm like, wow, I really needed that. He's like, sorry, I can't hold space for you right now because my two-year-old is suffering. So 
just just to let you know, like, you know, it's 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 not it can be used pretty pretty casually, I would say. It doesn't have to it could be an intense session with a friend or it can be a just a like five minute listening. And I think it's also important I think there's a lot of trust comes up when someone says to you, hey, I don't have the ability to hold space right now. Because that there, means that they're taking care of themselves. And that's really important. Love it. Like I had a, you know, we had, I had another friend who, you know, I was like, hey, can I talk right now? And she's like, I don't, I don't, I'm not available for until tomorrow. Right. I may not have needed her tomorrow, but she was like, she was like, I'm full today. And here's when I can do it. So also putting a timeline around that. So she gets an A plus for boundaries. Yes, A plus for boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see. What do we got? I think we should go to triggered. Right oh, now, okay. Because we've been talking about that. Okay. Good idea. Go ahead. So in psychology, a trigger is a stimulus that causes a painful memory to resurface. And this can be like a lot of, it can be someone talking. Um, but it could also be a sensory reminder, a sound, a sight, a smell, right. physical sensation. Um, it could even be a time of day or a season. And that sensory stimulation results in the person experiencing a strong emotional reaction of fear, shock, anger, or worry. In, in a like, psychological setting, this often has to do like PTSD, like a traumatic event happened in the past yeah. and is bringing this up. And so then you say, oh, the, you are triggered. And you may have heard of like veterans experiencing PTSD events when they're triggered and it reminds them of a wartime setting. Yeah, good example. It's definitely used more casually now. I'm definitely not a veteran. I do not have PTSD um, and I use this term a lot. It's, it's often, it's a, it's a synonym for being annoyed or in fear or shock or anger. It's all of those things. And what it is for me is, it's, it's not that it's associated to a traumatic event, but it is an opportunity for me to reflect about why am I reacting this way to this particular stimulus or to this particular person or to what they said. It, it is, does shine a flashlight onto my own inner state. And thus is an opportunity for like deeper excavation of my soul. Beautifully said. I do think for me, I do use it in this casual way, as my husband just pointed out recently, that like triggered is not really the correct thing. And he wasn't accusing me. He was just saying it gets tossed around a lot now. Yeah, I would say I would almost redefine it as it's just a personal growth tool. And for me, this is directly related to me being triggered. And instead of saying, it's your fault that I'm feeling this way, I'm like, hmm, why am I feeling this way? What's it about for me? Where's my insecurity? Where's my defensiveness? Why am I not in my radiance? <laughs> and it really is. Uh, it, so in a sense, it's a new word. I don't, it does feel like I use it in place of annoyed. And yet I, I want, I feel like it's an up level from that. Yeah, I think it's more than that. Because I, for me, there's also oftentimes it's a visceral reaction. Like I'll get flushed or my throat will constrict. I'll feel like I'm about to start crying. Yeah. Um, you know, I have lost presence. Yep. I, like my eyesight gets, you know, like dim, right? Or like, you know, like I just get really like, it, things start to just like shut down. I guess another phrase would be like, I'm off-centered, I'm not grounded. Yeah. But all of these things result, so I agree, someone yeah. might tell us what a better word is than trigger, but um, that all of those reactions in my body are pointing yeah. to something that's worth me looking at. Yeah. Great. Okay. So after all that triggering talk... Um, <laughs> Let's talk about landing meditation. A, land, a short, a landing meditation is a short meditation often used at um, the beginning of a group setting, a meeting, a workshop, interaction, a one-on-one -on -one with a group that helps center calm and prepare the collective, bringing everyone back to the present moment with an open heart so that they can learn, share, and express with less distraction and more ease. 
I started seeing this done, I would say more post-pandemic at Zoom meetings. And I offer a landing meditation on most of my client and sales calls to give people a taste of even what it's the, like. Even on the sales calls, like you're a 30 minute, like. Sometimes, yeah, yeah I feel yeah. it out because I think it really gives people an idea of how I work and what we're moving toward, right. not just messaging, but presence, excavation of the soul, being brave, getting vulnerable, digging in. Oh my gosh, it must be so fun to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I'm going to yeah. do, okay, yeah. do this landing meditation now. Yay. And cheers to my therapist, Deborah, who really also gave me the idea in the beginning. I'd heard it from the phrase from you, but then she did a meditation in the beginning of our therapy session each time that was so nurturing for me. So let's take a moment from getting here to being here. Close your eyes. Two more deep breaths into stillness. We're grateful for how far you brave hearts have come. We're grateful for your brilliant future. We're grateful mostly for this present moment where we get to channel your spirit, guidance, and insight toward raising your vibration, expressing your voice, and considering your own bravery as you navigate uncertainty. With less should and more shine, we sink into this moment and this moment only with an open heart and a beginner's mind. Two more deep breaths. One with an audible sigh. <sighs> and so it is. Feel free to open your eyes. Yay. I'm so happy. <laughs> you just Does did that. feel good. That, my friends, is a landing meditation. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I would not have talked about a landing meditation five years ago. That is for sure. Okay, Bravehearts, this is the last definition in the relationships category. And I'm going to talk about twin flame. Whew. So this kind of relationship is said to be between two people who discover a soul connection and are very fundamentally similar to each other. Because of this, they function like a spiritual mirror, a soul mirror that reflects each other's strengths, weaknesses, past traumas, and vulnerabilities. Twin flames challenge us to do better, and oftentimes their purposes are aligned in a way that pushes both of them to new heights. It's a very expansive relationship, promotes a lot of growth, but it tends to be very intense. And it is because of that that it's not common for twin flames to be lifelong partners. Rather, they're people who enter your life for a period of time or a phase when you need them and they help you grow and keep you on course and then say goodbye. Uh, my boyfriend and I believe that we are each other's twin flame and that we were twins in a previous life. Yeah. It's intense. <laughs> can you feel it in my voice? <laughs> I can. Yeah. There's a whole different <laughs> vibration that happened when you brought that one in. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, it is a big deal. And I feel really fortunate to have found a twin flame in my life. But keep in mind that twin flame definitions vary across the internet. And you're going to, you have to define it for what it means the most to you. Yeah. And I remember I had never even heard of that term um, until I met you. And so it's not that everyone finds their twin flame. Yeah. And and this is perfect. This leads us, I think, really well into our spiritual category because in a way that the twin flame is like almost falls into a re spiritual relationship. That's very true. Type. All right, spirituality, baby. Let's go. 
Are you ready for this? Am I ready for this? Like, is my dad ready for this? Like, here I am, dad, giving a podcast and I'm defining spirituality and the words associated. <laughs> Remember her dad was a priest? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and my mom was a nun. Okay. And yeah. This is definitely um, a journey, an unexpected journey <laughs> that my dad did not expect me to take. Okay. Life force energy. This is believed by every culture or every continent around the world, that there is this energy that unifies us and is like a unifying consciousness. The European culture calls it life force energy. Hindu has different words for it. Kundalini, Shakti, Prana. Oh yeah, okay. Christian and Christianity call it Holy Spirit. The Chinese call it Chi. The Jewish call it Shekinah. The Hindu definition of prana is described this way. It's translated from the Sanskrit as breath of life, spirit energy, or vital principle. This term is used in yogic teachings as a general reference to the manifest energy of the entire universe. Wow. This original creative power is constantly flowing around us and inside of us. I would say that my journey of Tantra has helped me untangle the differences between pleasure, sex, intimacy, and life force energy and give me much greater clarity about life force, it tapping into my life force energy. Wow. Big too. It, it, it has a lot of weight and... I think I've only tapped into it probably in the last couple of years, what I can name as that life force energy. Do you want to describe how it feels or an example of when you I would, felt it? I would say that I think that like life force energy to me is the feeling of being alive. Like it's almost, it's like almost for me, it's like a vibration or like a current, being in this current of energy. And I would also say it's very creative. Like when someone is in the flow yeah. of creativity or in a flow state of climbing a mountain or being in a race or a runner, like, like flow states are the, I think the equivalent of being in a, uh, activated and within life force energy. It's interesting because that to me then is not really related necessarily to spirituality or religion. It can be. But I remember first reading the definition of flow when I was in the Peace Corps. I remember sitting on our little shitty futon in that little kitchen in Bulgaria and reading the definition of flow coined by this Czech philosopher called Csikszentmihalyi. And, and believe me, the, the spelling of that name is not intuitive. But, <laughs> but Csikszentmihalyi said, this is when you just feel so in the flow that you have lost track of all time and you don't you're not paying attention to the outside world for long periods of time. And that then became my, my goal with writing, with creativity. And I can find it now when I sit on my porch for long enough. But it, it comes and goes, right? Sometimes I can snap into it in five minutes. And other times it takes an hour. And other times I never find it. So I would describe that as being in the spiritual state of being connected to source or being able to let be in, yeah. like, in an expanded consciousness. Yeah. So I'm just connecting to like two threads right now. The other part though, that I, I felt with life force energy is more of a, like a heart lifting and even a breath, like a physical feeling of release or breath flowing through me. That's, I would say, yeah, more heart related than mind related. I mean, that, that resonates. I, what's coming up for me is Jamie Wheel of the Recapture the Rapture has another book called Stealing Fire. And I have like, <laughs> like feeling my body constrict of like, oh, this is Janelle <laughs> Andrews' definitions of flow states and spirituality and, uh, and life force energy. Again, this is like another like body of work of like some people may not connect life force energy to spirituality. It's certainly not in the way that we described it. And so we're just speaking to our own experiences of what how it shows up. I just saw lives. you like close the rabbit hole. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to go ahead and like fill with some dirt in that rabbit hole. We are not going there. Uh, yeah, I get it. I get it. 
Uh, beautiful. Yeah, no. Now let's move on to Wu. How about that? <laughs> Good idea. Because that's like so concrete and understandable and shit, right? <laughs> um, right. I think you should do this one. Okay. Yeah. Wu is a slang term. It's really woo woo, though. Woo woo is how oh, right. it, started. it started. It's not okay. just woo. We have shortened it, sh- you know, in our pithy society that needs to shorten everything, which I participate in too. But. Right, right, right. Like something was really woo woo. I, that, I'm Remember? Like bringing that back. <laughs> yeah. Bringing that back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now, yeah, now I have shortened it to woo for myself. And woo is a slang term used to describe those who believe in phenomena that lack substantiated evidence to prove the claim of the phenomena. Another definition is to be in a state of awakened awe or wonder. Mm. It feels very resonant to me. Totally. To connect to higher awareness and power, to have magical properties, to be curious about the incredible. Ooh. Like everything about this is like lighting me up. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. This you should be like, their poster child. Yeah, I'm the poster child. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lobby to get your picture on the Wikipedia Woo page. This state is like, oh my gosh. And so, and at the same time, like Woo is something I didn't believe in and, and psychics and Woo and all that for a long time. And now, yeah, I've just opened the portal in my being somewhere that just allows all of this to come in and it, it and you know, it's my own flavor of woos, which we've talked about in another episode. And the guy that I'm dating right now, I'm just, I, I, every time I see him, which isn't all that often, it's every couple of weeks. And I'll be like, all right, are you ready for like the latest woo experience? And he's like, bring it on. Yeah. He does not subscribe to woo um, and yet finds me endearing, luckily. So Ooh, that's awesome, though. That's great. <laughs> and describes, yeah, it finds my like description of woo endearing because I'm not trying to convince him of anything. Mm-hmm. I am just expressing with joyful radiance my experience. Yeah. So let's, let me just pause on woo for a second because I think this is where I am with you, but not you're you're further down along the woo line. For sure than me. (laughs) I guess I just want to express to you, Bravehearts, that I get it. Like, you have to just find your flavor of woo and see what resonates. Not everything resonates for everyone. Maybe none of it will resonate for you. But it can be very affirming and uplifting. And there doesn't need to be proof for me to to feel something and have it influence my life in a positive way. Yes. And I would say that's probably the key piece is, is it influencing your life in a positive way? If there is no proof and it's influencing your life in a negative way, I would maybe rethink that. Yeah. Yeah. So to learn more about my specific flavors of woo, you can listen to the episode, All the Woo That's Crazy and True. Okay. All right. Your turn again. Okay. Okay. So the other term that we use a lot is the goddess temple, which is where we are right now. It's where I live. It's where we record the podcasts. And... The name, the goddess temple, came to me um, in a mushroom journey, and I love it. <laughs> I love where I live. Um, the, my home is full of really incredible art, but more importantly, the energy of the goddess temple is one of love, laughter, and nourishment. And there's a ritual that I do for anyone who comes for the first time to the goddess temple, which is called the glitter ritual. Uh-huh. And for those of you watching, uh, you can see me do this right now. I have a jar of glitter glister at the front door. When you walk in, I invite you to take it in your hand, this jar of glitter, put it to your heart, close your eyes, take a breath, and reflect where on your body needs some glitter and then I invite you to open your eyes and I apply or you apply the glitter to wherever you need it and that is the ritual I do to let you know you have entered the goddess temple and you are welcome I love it another term that I use a lot is shamanic state 
which is an altered state of consciousness that occurs without the use of psychedelics or other mind altering substances. And during the butt plugs episode, I spoke, my, my, I spoke about my experience with the Tantrika um, as a shamanic state. And what happened during that time is that unconscious thoughts became conscious regarding lived experiences of sexual shame. Okay. Yeah. So when we talk about our truth, obviously you know what the word truth means in normal conversation. Um, but when I say I want to help a client or I want to help Janelle or I want to help myself get one step closer to my truth, I'm talking about a deep knowing that sometimes gets buried under cultural conditioning and outside expectations. Pretty simple. Simple, not easy. <laughs> simple, not easy. Okay. Here we are in the lifestyle category, which is what we talk about a lot. So in fact, should we talk about the word lifestyle? Do we have a definition for the word lifestyle? No, I don't even want to go there. Like, it's so broad. Like, so I want to say <laughs> that people, when, when you say, hey, I'm in the lifestyle, my experience with that if I am in the lifestyle or we are in the lifestyle means that we are in the ethical non-monogamy world. Okay. Fair enough. I don't have enough experience. I know what you're talking about, but I think it just depends um, on the group and the culture and the state and the people <laughs> and, and the religion. <laughs> um, but I, I hear you. I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so I guess maybe the, the, it's not the word lifestyle, it's the phrase, we're in the lifestyle, yeah. is what I'm trying to define there. That makes sense. So, okay, we're going to start with e &M or CNM, ethical non-monogamy okay. or conscious non-monogamy, synonyms. Got it. So it's an umbrella term, an ethical non-monogamy or conscious non-monogamy refers to any relationship dynamic in which partners consent each other to pursue sexual and romantic connections with multiple people outside of the primary relationship. While monogamous people only have one serious relationship at a time, ethically non-monogamous people don't limit their options in this way. So ENM, again, ethical non-monogamy, is an umbrella term that catches other terms like being open, swinging, and polyamory. Typically, polyamory means a person desires close relationships with more than one person. So while polyamorous people are ENM, not all ENM people are poly. You can look this up online, certainly Google it anytime, and you're going to get a variety of definitions depending on the context and the source. But this should set the stage well for the way that we're talking about it. And a resource, if you just want to learn more, is Opening Up by Tristan Tormino. And she's a, she's a researcher and scientist and has a lot of great definitions about all of this. Great. So our take on ENM and poly, it's a very dynamic relationship format. And that it's never, it does, it's not static in the sense that in the very beginning of us dating, when my partner and I had opened up our relationship, we started out having shared sexual experiences with others. Uh -huh. For the most part, we were meeting them at sex clubs or at sex parties. Essentially, we were swinging. And that was intentional. The idea of either of us being emotional or romantically connected with others was overwhelming. So I was much more comfortable like, exploring this world with strangers than I was with people that we might actually already, already know. Already know. Got it. Yeah. But then over time, we realized that we were looking for deeper connections with others and that the swinging lifestyle did not appeal to us. But it was like an evolution. Like I, it, was a, it was a growth journey of constantly coming up against our edges in this world of ENM and finding, finding our way. And in our episode, Friends with Benefits, I talk about that my threesome with Andrea and my husband 
it was that that made me realize how deeply caring and knowing the other person who was with me and my partner, um, and in the case of a woman who had this sisterhood quality, friendship to it, made the threesome so much better. And it was that experience that opened me up to recognizing that I was polyamorous. Why don't you take Metamore? I feel like you use it a lot. Sure. So Metamore is someone who is a polyamorous partner's partner that they have no real romantic relationship with. So for example, in my life, my husband's girlfriend is my metamor and I am her metamor. I don't have a, I know her, but I do not really have a relationship or a strong friendship with her, but she is my metamor and I am hers. So that's, that's, it's pretty basic. Yes. And in the case of a spouse, right? Like your boyfriend and your husband are metamors. Actually, just because I think this is kind of fun. Is your husband's girlfriend and your boyfriend, are they metamors? Or is that like like second cousins, like they're one step removed? No, I think no. Okay. I think they're not related. (laughs) Um, So Tantra, take it away, Janelle. (laughs) You take this. Okay. Okay, I'm going to give you a really, 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 really high level overview of Tantra. Okay. Well, it's been around for thousands of years and has been practiced by Buddhists, uh, Tibetan Buddhists and Hindus. There is, and it's an integration of mind, body, spirit for the purpose of spiritual transcendence. There's a newer version that's been around for about 150 years that primarily focuses on sacred sexuality as the way towards either or spiritual transcendence. So connecting with something larger than ourselves. It's therapeutic and that it has a healing capacity to it. And there's pleasure and it looks at as pleasure as a divine birthright. Beautiful. I've never heard you break it down that way. That's, that's like really easy to understand. The three again are our, sp- our spirituality, therapeutic and pleasure. Nice. Okay. That, that helps because it is thrown around a lot and it, it, it generally feels it's like something to do with sex when I see the Tantra word, mm-hmm. um, which is true, but that helps give it much more, more meaning for me. And really, yeah, the, I think the con- assumption to connection to sex is very like trendy right now and can make the headlines, but it, it's a lot of it has to do with like the energy and the energies of two people coming together and activating this life force energy, which we already spoke about earlier. Right. And so a tantrika, which is another word we have used, Mm -hmm. is someone who incorporates this activation of life force energy into a healing practice. Nice. Okay. I love it when things feel so whiteboarded. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Lots of structure. I'm like holding on to that structure and Mm -hmm. great. Helps me understand. So we got somewhere on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So intimacy... Another word that can often be um, equated to sex or relating to sex uh, is I have now taken on that term, and I think you have as well, There's, there are broader definitions of it. And so this idea that I realize that I'm, intimacy can be sexual, but it can also be like sharing secrets or vulnerabilities. Yes, Longings, agreed. desires. There's also this way of like, a, like intimacy as like a deep knowledge of something. And so I realized that I, my nature is to be deeply intimate with people. Yeah. And with my girlfriends, with family. And so that intimacy may or may not include sexual intimacy. But it's important to me. Yeah. Yeah, here, here. I completely agree. So what about pleasure? Something we've spoken about quite a bit too, especially in that butt plug episode. According to Webster's, pleasure indicates desire, a state of gratification, which all makes sense, um, as a source of delight or joy. And I think that's all I'm going to say about it. I think to get more on pleasure pillars, um, please, you can listen to our episode number 10. Um, It's 
it's going to go much deeper into the source of your pleasure. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, we might as well just throw in butt plugs for good measure as yeah. a word. <laughs> My friend Pete did say, he's like, I don't know what spear crowns are. However, butt plug seems pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then maybe we don't have to define it. Oh, no, no. Say a sentence now that you've... Yeah. Okay. A butt plug is a sex toy that is designed to be inserted into the rectum for sexual pleasure. And we have a whole episode about my first experience with a butt plug and Andrea's assistance with yes. it. And yeah, to be honest, I'm still a little bit scared about the butt plug. <laughs> so, but I'm ready for you. I'll hold your hand. <laughs> you will. I know Try you will. Show up. I totally know you will. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So awkward. We have awkward. Uncomfortable. Go ahead. Or not really. <laughs> no, I'm just stating how I'm feeling. Yeah, in the moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in the moment. Okay, so we have mentioned a few different resources. And these are books, and I'm going to recap them right now. These three books have been deeply influential for me. One, if you are interested in learning more with like actual definitions and history um, about anything that we were talking about here, I highly, highly recommend Jamie Wheel's book, Recapture the Rapture, Rethinking God, Sex, and Death in a World That's Lost Its Mind. Quite a title. Quite a title. <laughs> you can also look him up on YouTube. You can go to the website. Yeah, he's, he's really incredible. The other book that has had a really big impact, impact on me uh, was Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. And the third one was Opening Up by Tristan Termino. Nice. Okay. So Bravehearts. I would love you to choose your favorite word and try it on for size this week. See what happens when you throw it out there. How do people respond? Do people ask about it? Do they just roll with it? And inside they're thinking, what is he talking about? But it's fun. It's fun to learn new vocabulary and weave it into your life. Yeah. And by all means, feel free to look any of them up and be like, oh, like there's a lot of information about all of this stuff that's out there. Yeah. And if you have questions, feel free to email us or call. Um, we're happy to go further into a word if you're, uh, if you're interested. Yes. Yeah. Any episode ideas are also welcome. Yes. Thanks, Bravehearts. Have a good day. Ciao, ciao. Do you need permission to be human? You got it. Listen, subscribe, and review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Learn more about us at permissiontobehuman.live.